In experience three, you were introduced to Samuel Morton. In the mid-19th century, he was measuring cranial capacity, the volume within a skull, with the assumption that very small differences in cranial capacity corresponded to differences in intelligence. For experience four, we have stepped into the post-Civil War era. At the end of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century, American psychologists adopted the new idea of particulate inheritance and applied this to human intelligence. You've already read chapter three from Carl Zimmer's book, She Has Her Mother's Laugh, or maybe you are planning to read it after you watch this video. Either way, I wanted to dive a bit more into the details of how intelligence was being quantified and how it was assumed to be inherited at the time. Zimmer mentions it, but he doesn't go much into the details. And so, this video. We need to start back in France. Alfred Binet was a French psychologist who served as the director of the psychology laboratory at the Sorbonne, the famous university in Paris. One of Binet's first research projects was to measure the head sizes of school children as a proxy for intelligence, but he grew to be very skeptical of this approach, as he found that the differences between intelligent and less intelligent children was well within measurement error, and that the children were presented for measurement at the same time that a teacher told him whether or not the child was intelligent. Did this information bias his result? Given that he often found just a one millimeter difference between smart and not so smart, he threw his hands up in frustration and quit that approach. But in 1904, he was commissioned, Binet was commissioned by the Minister of Public Education to develop techniques for identifying children whose lack of success in normal classrooms suggested the need for some form of special education. Along with his collaborator, Theodore, Theodore Simon, Binet did just this and published revisions of his intelligence scale in 1908 and 1911, the last appearing just before his death. The aim of this scale was to identify in order to help and improve, not to label in order to limit. Binet was clear that he saw no applicability to children who are doing fine. Binet proclaimed that his scale could not be a measurement of intelligence because intelligence is too complex to capture with a single number. As I mentioned though, Alfred Binet died in 1911, and so he had no say on what happened to his scale after. Lewis Terman, an American psychologist at Stanford University, developed an innovation to Binet's measurement in 1912, in which mental age is divided by chronological age, and he claimed that it could measure and categorize at all levels of achievement. This was, of course, a far cry from what it was originally intended for, but this is what we, um, but this is what we now know as IQ, the intelligence quotient, a number calculated by a person's performance on the Stanford Binet test. I want to introduce you to a term, a concept now, a word to know, reification. When you reify something, you convert a mental concept into a thing. You make something abstract into something concrete. For example, the economy. I mean, what is the economy? It's a whole bunch of different things, but when you put them all together, we call them the economy, but there isn't like a thing there. You can't like, you know, go and see the economy. You know, it's, it's just, this, this concept that we have created. We've turned it into something real. Now remember, Binet thought that intelligence is too complex to capture with a single number. But here, the Stanford Binet test was a number, and it measured something, as numbers do, and so IQ became a thing. It was reified. You could put a number on it. It must be meaningful. The reification of intelligence was set in motion. Now, there was a way to measure intelligence 
The next step was to explore how it came to be. Was this influenced by genes, or how a person's intelligence came to be? Was it influenced by genes? Is intelligence inherited? The psychologist Henry Goddard is one of the most prominent of the scientists who developed the hereditarian theory of intelligence, of IQ. Having translated Binet's work into English, he was there at the beginning. He decided that there was a unilinear classification of mental deficiency. The scale that he developed went from idiots to imbeciles to morons, and specifically, a moron had a mental age of 8 to 12. An imbecile had a mental age of three to seven. An idiot had a mental age of three. Scientific terms. And of these scientific designations, he deemed morons as the most dangerous to society because they could pass among society without being as easily detected. Another important element that American psychologists brought to the concept of intelligence is an intermingling of intelligence and morality. Goddard and others thought that people who are more educated and intelligent can more readily control their sex drive. Therefore, people who were more interested in sex, who were more promiscuous, they were, by definition, less intelligent. This is a very American perspective rooted in a strong puritanical influence. Goddard had developed his three categories of mental deficiencies, and then he started to consider how this might relate to biology, and in particular, inheritance. As you'll remember, the monk Gregor Mendel had figured out particulate inheritance back in the mid 1800s. His work was published in 1865, his research, though, had remained mostly unread for quite a while. Apparently, Darwin even had a copy of Mendel's work in his library, but he had never cut the pages, meaning he'd never read it. But in 1900, three botanists independently and essentially simultaneously discovered it. The idea of the gene, coined in 1909 by Wilhelm Johansson, was an incredibly exciting research area. Goddard was paying attention, and he started to think about intelligence, or a lack thereof, that it might be inherited. Goddard was serving as the director of the Vineland Training School for the Feeble-Minded, an institution that gave him the ideal setting in which to study how feeble-mindedness was passed down through family lineages. You read in Zimmer's chapter about Goddard's study of the Kalakak quote-unquote, Kalakak family. This was published first in 1912, and here you were looking at a pedigree of how feeble-mindedness was passed down from the woman shaded in the circle here, such that the descendants on her side of the family tree suffered from the same mental infliction. Goddard, in conclu Goddard concluded that Quote, normal intelligence seems to be a unit character and transmitted in true Mendelian fashion. <laughs> normal intelligence as a unit character. Morons, he deemed, were homozygous for a bad allele. Laborers were heterozygous, so they only had one copy of the bad allele. And then his conclusion was, don't let native morons breed and we should keep the foreign ones out. Here is one of the photos that were included in Goddard's book, photos that showed the depravity of the children on the feeble-minded side of the Kalakak family. Now, this was a time when published photographs, photographs in general, were still quite new, and people were naive when they were looking at them and seeing manipulation when it had occurred. I want to show you um, some photographs. So here is a, a photograph of Deborah, who was the uh, the, the representative of the, of the quote unquote Calicut family at the Vineland School. You read about her in Zimmer's book. And I want to show you a blown up part of that photograph you were just looking at of her relatives who were not in the Vineland School. Do you notice, if you look carefully at those children's eyes, that they've been blackened in with ink? the lips blackened in with ink. It gives them a sinister feel, and perhaps to you, who is 
quite sophisticated with with digital technology. <laughs> These are a joke. Of course, they're not real. They were manipulated. But at the time, people didn't know that. And this looked like convincing evidence that it was indeed, feeble-mindedness was indeed passed down. It was inherited through families. Goddard also focused on immigrants. He used the Stanford Binet test to assess the intelligence of immigrants as they arrived at Ellis Island with a focus on four groups, Jews, Hungarians, Italians, and Russians, my ancestors. Goddard felt that women were more keen on detecting feeble-mindedness, and so he hired women to watch as immigrants disembarked from their very long sea voyage. As you can see in this photograph here, these people, they just arrived in America, carrying all their belongings, tired from a long boat ride, cramped into small quarters, exhausted, disoriented. The women that Goddard hired would pull people out of the line if they thought they looked suspicious and they had them take an IQ test. <laughs> imagine, imagine, you just got off this boat and you're asked to take this line, this test, you're pulled out of line and asked to take this test. Here's the test. One is they asked people to draw a design from memory or they asked them to identify the missing part of a picture. Here, look at these. Let's see how you would do. What is the missing part of each of these pictures? One, mouth, okay. Two, her eye or maybe her earrings. Maybe she can't really see her eyes. Or should she have on a hat? Three, okay, a nose. Four, um, well, if you are of the culture that would eat with a fork or spoon, you might say fork or spoon, but if you're not, Hmm. What about in this one? Number five is a picture of a house. What's missing? Well, some people would say that from some cultures that that um, a, 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 a image that you would hang um, by the door to ward off evil would be missing. But no, the answer is the chimney. Or what about that rabbit? Yep, missing an ear. And what about number seven? It's a light bulb. And if you're not familiar with light bulbs at the time, they're supposed to be a filament. What about number eight? It's a letter. It's addressed, and it has a postage mark. But it is it the, the return address, or is it the stamp that's missing? Hmm. And here, a violin without strings. A pocket knife, missing a rivet. And then a gun missing the trigger. A pig missing its tail. A crab missing a leg. Two cats, but one of them doesn't have a shadow. Number 15, what are they doing? Oh, they're bowling. They're supposed to have, they're supposed to have a bowling ball in their hands. And what is the game they're playing in 16? Ah, tennis. They're missing the tennis net. 17, 18, 19, and 20. What are these testing? What are these testing for? A familiarity with these cultural, these cultural elements. So immigrants were also asked to list as many words as they knew in three minutes. Today, if you asked an 11-year-old child, they'll give you about 200 words on average. The immigrants were giving about 60 words, even in their native tongue. Oh, and they asked you the date and the time. Now I ask you, have you ever gotten off a long international flight? Were you disoriented? Were you uncertain about the time and day? Uh, perhaps you weren't thinking your clearest? Well, yeah. And if you're being tested on cultural knowledge, hmm, how well are you going to do? But let's ignore that and let's look at the results that Goddard's work found. Goddard's Binet tests on immigrants. 
So he tested for four groups. Well, he tested among four groups. And he found that 80 per, 83% of Jews, 80% of Hungarians, 79% of Italians, 87% of Russians, they were all feeble-minded. They all scored below age 12 on the Binet scale. This is what he had to say about it, and I quote, The results obtained by the foregoing evaluation of the data are so surprising and difficult of acceptance that they can hardly stand by themselves as valid. <laughs> now, I'm a scientist, and I am very well aware that extraordinary results require extraordinary evidence. If some result is so unexpected and difficult to accept, then perhaps you should be very skeptical that your data are revealing what you think they are. Maybe you measured something other than what you intended. You go back to the drawing board if it doesn't make sense sense if it's hard to believe. This had an immediate impact on immigration and in fact deportations for mental deficiency increased by 350% in 1913 and 570% in 1914. And in fact in my family was a set of brothers that had immigrated and one of them didn't stay. And I have not been able to figure out if this might have been why, because it was around the exact same time and coming through Ellis Island. Another huge set of intelligence tests continued on this theme. Let's now add the psychologist Robert Yerkes to our story. Yerkes really wanted to pull psychology into the realm of a respected science, and he thought that rigor in science means numbers and quantification. In 1915, he started to see an opportunity arise. As the U.S. began to ramp up its entry into World War I, which happened in 1917, Yerkes convinced the federal government to give mental tests to all of the Army recruits. The army mental tests. Okay, so these are these intelligence, these are intelligence tests that were being administered to men who were being um, conscripted into the army. They were being trained to go fight at war. So you have, you have these, these leaders in the army who are tasked with training these young men and getting them ready to fight in a war. And they've been asked to take time out of that training to administer an intelligence test. So the men were brought into a room, giant rooms, and asked to uh, take these tests. So remember, mo mo mobilization for World War I, and all of the recruits would be tested. Not a subset, but all of them. So this required that they be brought into very large rooms. There was not air conditioning. <laughs> It was hot, it was crowded, it was difficult to hear, and you had someone barking instructions way at the end of the room who would be very hard to hear at the other, difficult to concentrate. You had an hour, had to go very quickly. But the idea was that all of these tests would provide a baseline for intelligence. This is the baseline for intelligence testing that would happen after that. All in all, the tests were administered to 1.75 million recruits. Here's the test. There were three types. There was the Army Alpha, which was for literate recruits, recruits who could read and write. There was an Army Beta, which was given to recruits who failed the Alpha, who were deemed illiterate. And then there was a version of the Binet Scales for the recruits who failed Beta. So men would also then need to be returned um, from, removed from their training temporarily and returned for another test. You can imagine how much the army loved this. But let's see how you would do. So here, is, here are some questions from that um, uh, alpha test. Crisco is a patent medicine, a disinfectant, toothpaste, or a food product? Do you know? 
<laughs> maybe you don't bake much, or maybe you're a little bit on the healthier side than how we used to bake when I was growing up, but Crisco is very definitely a food product. The number of a kafir's legs is two, four, six, or eight. Do you know what a kafir is? Oh, it's a very bad derogatory word. The answer is two. Christy Mathewson is famous as a writer, artist, baseball player, or comedian. Do you know? If you didn't know, if you don't know, you would have gotten it wrong. Well, this is actually a very famous baseball player who was playing for the Giants back when I think they were still playing in New York. So the results of the army mental tests well, they certainly did collect a lot of data, as you can imagine. But what these data told them were pretty surprising. The average mental age for white men was just above 13. Remember, for, according to Goddard, mental ages 8 to 12 were considered moron. The average Russian, Italian, and Polish man had a mental age between 11.34 and 10.74. Oh, the precision, the scientific precision. <laughs> Blacks had an average mental age of 10.41. And perhaps surprisingly, lighter-skinned Blacks scored highest. There's a lot of data, as I mentioned, and not all of it was emphasized when the study was published. Researchers who have gone back through those monographs have pulled out pieces of, of other um, pieces of information that were not emphasized. So some of the other results that, that Yerkes and Goddard did not emphasize were that there was a strong correlation between average score and hookworm infestation. Hookworms are a form of parasite. There was a strong correlation, 0.75, between test score and amount of schooling. And they found that test scores for foreign-born recruits rose consistently with the number of years of, rev of residence the recruit had had in the United States. What really were they testing? Apparently, they were testing for your familiarity with American culture, with your familiarity with the things that Americans were teaching in school at the time. And apparently, they were testing for how well you could perform when you have, uh, how well, how much parasites and hookworm infestation affected your ability to take a test. But the interpretations of those data. They concluded that feeble-mindedness is of much greater frequency than was previously recognized. Goddard said, quote, much of our effort to change conditions is unintelligent because we have not understood the nature of the average man. The president of Colgate University, Cutton in 1922, he said, quote, we cannot conceive of any worse form of chaos than a real democracy in a population of average intelligence of a little over 13 years. Imagine that the average man in the United States has an intelligence a little over 13 years. It is almost unbelievable. <laughs> it should have been unbelievable because it is. But lots was made of this. I'd like to introduce you now to David Starr Jordan. He was a natural historian, born in New York, taught at Indiana University, and then he moved out to become the first president of Stanford University. Now, he thought that there were three kinds of poor. There was the Lord's poor, who are temporary victims of misfortune. The devil's poor, they bring on their own wretchedness. And paupers, people who inherited their feeble minds and feeble wills. And the thing that, that he worried a lot about was that war, he was rapidly against war. He was worried that war is dysgenic because 
We send off our best and our brightest to go fight in wars, which means that we leave those who are not the best and the brightest. We leave them at home with the women. David Starr Jordan, yay Stanford, <laughs> if you want to get into that rivalry, I'm not sure Berkeley would win, but uh, David Starr Jordan was essential in using his political capital to help establish the United States Eugenics Record Office. This was in Cold Spring Harbor in New York. The first director of the Eugenics Records Office was Harry Laughlin. <coughs> he was the first and I believe the only director. And the thing about him was that in this position as the director of the ERO, he was able to have quite a bit of political influence. He drafted um, the model sterilization law that was implemented in a number of different states, but that formed the basis of Virginia's Racial Integrity Act of 1924 that you'll hear um, a bit more about in the next experience. He also had a pretty significant influence on immigration. I want to introduce you to a couple of immigration um, laws that were passed the Immigration Restriction Act of 1921. In 1921, the law said that you could only have 3% of immigrants from any nation that was then resident in America. 3% of the people who were already here, so who of, of immigrants, the, the source nations of where immigrants had come previously. But this was restricted. So in 1924, only 2% of people from each nation recorded in the 1890 census. Do you remember? We talked about the 1890 census earlier in this module. In 1890, Southern and Eastern Europeans arrived in relatively small numbers before, but they predominated after. Now, Calvin... Calvin Coolidge, as he signed the 1924 bill, President Coolidge, he said, America must be kept American. Let's look at some of the data of where people were coming from. So 1881 to 1890, looking at these six pie charts here, no, starting 1881 to 1890 in the upper left-hand corner, the red part um, of the pie shows people the proportion of immigrants coming from Northwestern Europe. And the blue, the small slice, which is only about 20%, shows the number of people coming from Southeast, the proportion coming from Southeastern Europe. 1891 to 1900, this was a bit more evenly divided, almost 50-50. And then by 1901 um, to 1910, um, you, had, you had about 75% of people coming from Southeastern Europe. Excuse me, I think I just misspoke and was talking about the immigration during uh, Thomas Jefferson. Sorry about that. Um, forget that, <laughs> that comment. That makes no sense. Okay, so 1901 to 1910, about 75% of the immigrants coming into the country were from Southeastern Europe. And this decreases. 1911 to 1920, it decreases even more, 1921 to 1930, as those Immigration Restriction Acts go into effect. And by 1931 to 1940, you're back to perhaps only about 30% or so of people, or 35% of immigrants coming into the United States, coming from Southeastern Europe. This anti-immigration this eugenics, this increased nationalism. So running up to the start of World War II, this was happening across Europe as well as here. One of the things to keep in mind with World War II in Europe and the Holocaust is that 11 to 17 million people died. And of those, there were 6 million Jews, including 1 million children two-thirds of the nine million who were living in Europe at the time. Other people who died in the Holocaust were Soviet elites, Serbians, Romanians, homosexuals, prisoners of war, and people with handicap. 
All in all, in World War II, 60 million people died. It was 2.5% of the world's population. Now, keeping in mind the number of immigrants that were trying to escape the political instability of Europe, trying to come to the United States, I want to point out that the quotas imposed in our immigration policy are estimated to have barred up to 6 million Southern, Central, and Eastern Europeans between 1924 and the start of World War II. This is all based on the idea that Goddard and others had that intelligence and the feeble-mindedness were heritable. I want to remind you what heritability means. Remember, we talked about this a few modules ago. Heritability is a characteristic of a population. You can't estimate heritability for an individual. It's a population descriptor. It's the proportion of the variance of a population that can be explained by genetic factors. So you can't talk about inheritance and heritability for an individual because it's a it's a proportion, it's a population description. Heritability is the proportion of the total variance that is attributed to genetic effects. So what we're seeing with the hereditarian theory of IQ is that American psychologists invented this, that this was, there's actually very little evidence of, of IQ being heritable. You'll read more about this in the next module. But what the hereditarians were doing is they reified Binet's scores. They, they, they just assumed they had some, some meaning, this one number. They took this one number as some measure of intelligence. And by doing this, they mistakenly equate heritable with inevitable. That if you, if you had this, this one allele of this one gene, that then it was inevitable what your intellig intelligence and potential would be and what your morals would be. And it's a very mistaken understanding of heritability. We will go into that quite a bit more in a reading for next week, for the next module. And with that, we come to the end.